Great. Um, thanks, Mark. And uh, welcome, everyone, to our second joint accessibility meeting of the term. Um, could we maybe go around the room just quickly to remind each other just of our names, because we have done the official introduction last time. Um, would you like to start, Sue? Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Sue Tiffin, Community Safety and Wellbeing Plan Coordinator for the County of Halberton. My name is Lisa Shell, and I'm the Deputy Mayor for the Town of Minden Hills. Um, and Anne, you are next in my circle, so why don't you go next? Hi, Dr. Anne Jackson, um, a, a teacher at York. <laughs> Great. Kathy Hughes, a uh, volunteer on the board. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, ben and Dykstra, county member. Perfect. Uh, Cease Ryle, I'm Deputy Mayor of Highlands East. And I'm Jen Dayu, Deputy Mayor of Algonquin Highlands. And I'm Mike Rudder, CAO for the county. And I think we, and we've got some staff in the background, but you'll be introducing yourself, I'm sure, when you come up. Okay, great. Um, so we respectfully acknowledge that the county of Halliburton is located on Treaty 20 Michisagi territory and in the traditional territory of the Michisagi and Chippewa nations, collectively known as the Williams Treaties First Nations, which are Curve Lake, Rama, Hiawatha, Alderville, Scugog Island, Beausoleil, and Georgina Island First Nations. We acknowledge a shared presence of Indigenous nations throughout the area and recognize its original Indigenous inhabitants as the stewards of its lands and waters since time immemorial. Now, has everyone had a chance to read the agenda? And may I have a mover and a seconder? Sue to move. And um, Sue. Sue's not a member. Oh, I see. Okay. She can't vote. I have Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so um, um, cease maybe to, to move and a seconder. And Lisa, great. Moved by Councillor Ryle, seconded by Councillor Shell. Be it resolved that the June 14th, 2023 Halliburton County Joint Accessibility Committee agenda be approved. All in favor? That's carried, thank you. Um, are there any disclosures of pecuniary interest or general nature thereof? Seeing none. Um, has everyone had an opportunity to review our minutes? And are there any comments or questions? May I have a mover and a seconder to adopt? Anyone? anyone? Yeah, um, Benin to move and cease to second. Thank you. <laughs> Moved by Member Dykstra, seconded by Member Ryle. Be it resolved that the minutes of the April 12th, 2023 meeting of Halliburton County Joint Accessibility Committee be adopted as circulated. All in favor? Great. It's carried. So now we're going to whip right down to um, point 11, new business. We have a few um, issues to discuss there, beginning with training on the role of committee members. Okay, so I um, we won't do a lot of training. We did provide a link that I, I hope you've had a chance to review. If not, I would certainly recommend it. Um, we, uh, your role is, is to advise municipal councils about the requirements and implementation of Ontario's accessibility standards. Those include customer service standard, employment uh, standard information and communication, transportation and public spaces. Um, I, as I say, I hope you've had some time to review the information. I will say that um, Michelle and I have reached out to the Accessibility Directorate for some more specific training about uh, the role of a committee and um, the, um, you know, sort of some, some best practices and other things. We participated in a webinar four years ago that I thought was really well received and I thought it was excellent. We haven't been able to access that. <laughs> yet. This is sort of the best we've been able to come up with uh, up to now, but we do hope to, um, I guess, expand on this and, and, uh, and find something that's a little more appropriate that we can all uh, do together, hopefully. Um, we, uh, we really would like some, um, I, I guess, we would, <laughs> we're really looking to you for advice on areas where the local municipalities, uh, the, where the county and the community as a whole can improve to become more accessible and uh, for everyone. Um, 
some of the uh, the suggestions uh, can become part of our committee work plan, which is you know sort of our our uh, bi-monthly meetings or or uh, um, at least quarterly meetings. But um, some of it could be training that in certain aspects like built environment. I I uh, I know that the Hanson Foundation has some pretty excellent training in built environment. So if that's an area where there's an interest for individual members or the the uh, committee as a whole, we uh, we can certainly look into those things. So we're looking for your suggestions on what we could be doing that way. Some of those could be goals that could be included in our multi-year accessibility plan, which you uh, from the from the guide uh, you can see that every community is required to have one of those. Um, we we. Uh, I know that in the past we've been much more engaged in in public education, providing public information uh, than we are currently. And so I'm really looking to the committee members if that's an area where you feel we could be making a difference and you've had some experience, uh, either lived experience or experience from another community where you think we could be doing better. We really are looking for your input on that. Um, at our next meeting, we're going to be bringing some of the policies forward that you uh, read about in that guide. Um, they, uh, all of our, we review most of our policies uh, periodically, but we do it regularly. Um, a number of those policies haven't been reviewed in, in some time. And so uh, I think it, it's appropriate that we bring those forward to you and get your input on some changes that we can take to council for consideration. Uh, we will talk a little bit about this later on, but we have uh, asked our local municipalities to provide us updates on their plans for the next five years. Once we receive those, we'll bring those to you. Um, and, and again, we're looking for you to, um, if you've experienced a barrier or you've, you've seen a barrier uh, that isn't addressed in those, we really like you to bring those forward and we can pass that information on to the local municipalities or the county, uh, the appropriate staff at the county. Um, and so we uh, will, that's something that we'll uh, talk in more detail about at our next meeting, hopefully. And uh, and again, we'll, we'll continue to work with municipal staff so that um, plans are, are brought in to the committee for review prior to finalization. One of, the, one of the things that I think we find is that um, there are so many codes and guidelines now that people are designing them and assuming that they meet are fully accessible. And I think we experienced that last week or last meeting uh, with a playground where it had been designed and it, it checked all the boxes for accessibility standards, but there, that doesn't necessarily mean that it functions well. Uh, for people with disabilities or for um, different abilities. So um, just because we meet design standards doesn't necessarily mean it works. And so um, we're really looking to you uh, and we hope to get those plans to you in a timely fashion so that you can uh, provide those comments before the plans are finalized. And, and uh, so that's one of the goals that we have. Um, the... Um, I, it was interesting as I reviewed some of that, I, I uh, you know, it became clear to me that even some of the things we use, like our, our weight in software and other things may not be as accessible as we'd like. And so those are things we're going to have to look at. Um, and we'll be looking to you for advice on how uh, to make those things more accessible as well. So um, that is, I think, all I really need to say about that. I really just want this to be uh, a place where we can have conversation so that if you see barriers or you become aware of barriers in the community, that you let us know about that. If you think that we could have be, be making a difference by, by doing more in terms of public education or and you have ideas about how we could do that, we'd really be interested in what you have to say on that. And um, And then, of course, there's our a regular review role of, of uh, facilities, uh, plans for the built environment, plans for other things. So um, I, I hope that that uh, gives you some sense of what our goals are for the coming term. Um, and, uh, but uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. What, do you have any uh, plans for the, the ramp outside this very building to improve it? We do. 
Uh, and and this gentleman is here to talk about that today. Oh, am I? No, no. Uh, the gentleman in the back there. Oh, my yes. apologies. So absolutely. Um, we know that we it, it's not ideal at all. Um, and I've got a question, too. Now, in our regular council meetings, new ideas that councillors want to bring forward have to be declared in advance so that the public knows that they're going to be topics of conversation at the meeting. What about for this group? Say Kathy or Anne has an idea. Can we just up with it or um, do we have to declare it the, the meeting before? Well, it's always up to the uh, but, but I, I would say that committees tend to be less formal, and so if there are ideas, uh, they may not have answered right away, but by all means, if there are suggestions or ideas, go to my happy to take that and want to bring something back. Great. Um, I think your mic was off. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I didn't mean, okay. Not the first, won't be the last. <laughs> um, no, I, I by all means, it's up to the chair to allow that conversation to take place. But um, I, I think committees tend to be less formal, and so it would be it would be great if people brought ideas or suggestions to the committee. Um, we may not have answers right away, but we can bring them back to the next meeting. So absolutely. Great. Hi, it's Anne here. Um, so if I see something as I'm sort of walking around uh, that, that I think may be something that, that could be addressed, so shall I just note it down in an email and send it uh, to Michelle? Is, is that sort of a, a good way to approach it? Absolutely. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks for everyone. I hope she pays more attention to your emails than she does to mine, Anne. But <laughs> I... <laughs> Did I, I just turned my priority off, did I? Or did I just reprioritize myself? Okay. I see. Okay, all right, that's great. Um, thank you, Mike. Um, shall we move to our update on alternative and augmentative communication board project with Sue? Hi everyone. Now that I know there's a priority button, <laughs> you're all in trouble. Um, so I am speaking today to a communication boards initiative that actually began several years ago. I'm very excited to be speaking to it. I also want to note that um, I am not an expert on communication boards. And so I'm going to speak to what I know, but I'm more than happy to hear from anybody else about what you know, or um, there might be differing opinions and I'm 110% open to that. Um, I think Andrea is joining us at this time, if possible. Yeah. Perfect. So um, I came to this committee a few years ago. Uh, so I apologize for repeating for some of you. Um, my daughter is an AAC user. And so um, I have been to some AAC training more than once because I loved it so much the first time I had to go back. Um, and I've also attended some AAC camps, which are uh, camps for people with commu uh, complex communication needs. Some of those camps happen in this area. There's actually one happening later in Minden this summer, and there are still spaces open. I needed to plug that for that organizer, uh, if anyone's interested. Um, I do think it's essential to get feedback from this committee and this community, especially AAC users on this initiative. And um, Andrea and I are here today because uh, it's it's a project that's hopefully starting soon and happening soon in Dysart. Hi, Andrea. So um, are you able to show the presentation, Mark? Sure. I, I thought it was important to go over um, not just the communication board concept, but um, some of the, the reasoning behind it. And so I'll speak to that a little bit. And then um, Andrea can speak to the Dice Art Project. And we're very happy to hear any feedback or anything that comes to mind as, as we're speaking to this. Hi, Anne here. Hi, Anne. I, uh, just one thing, I know a lot of people who sign is their first language. Um, is there any thought about actually putting some signs? I, I'm, I'm at, like, thank you and 
things like that on on the boards or would that make it too too sort of uh, busy because I, I know a lot of people like who who are a little bit older maybe um and so they may be the ones that are looking at the board and although it's terribly visual i think it's lovely i didn't know if there was any any thoughts of um sort of like sign language being included in there as well that's a great question and we did we did um talk about that a little bit and and that would be ideal i think if if the um layout of our board would include that i know that there i know that it's really common for kids in school to be learning sign language um my kids learn it outside of school as well and and so the more people who uh are familiarized with it and practicing with it and speaking with it um the better so so we'll show you the the sort of design concept a little bit later and and show you how that might fit in um, so can you head to slide three, Mark? Perfect, thank you. So um, this is typically what a communication board might look like. You might have seen it, you know, come through your, your news feed on social media, or you've seen them in different parks and playgrounds. Um, that's primarily where they are, are most often found right now. Uh, a few years back, they started showing up um, in playgrounds and in schoolyards in different places throughout the world. Australia was an early adopter. Um, there are a lot throughout Ontario. They all look a little bit different for the most part. Typically, they look like this. Uh, they are wood or vinyl um, attached to posts and fences. And while they might look to be for kids, um, they really are for everyone. So um, the intention is really to promote inclusion and awareness of, of these symbols that people use. So while it's ideal that um, everybody can use them. It, it is acknowledged that this isn't a robust communication system that most AAC users um, could or should have on their person. Next slide, please. So I'm referring to AAC, that's Augmentative and Alternative Communication. Augmentative and Alternative Communication is a type of communication that combines gestures, eye pointing, vocalizations, and pointing to symbols as communication for people with limited speech abilities. And the next slide, please. There are many examples of AAC. You probably use them yourself throughout, throughout your day. Um, you see other people use them. So mostly what we are talking about today is the idea of communication books and speech generation devices. Um, and just for better understanding, those are um, sort of the same thing. Uh, one is light tech. So the communication book is light tech and the speech generation device is high tech. In the case of the communication book, you would point to it or a user would point to it. Um, and it's a it's a paper book that's generally laminated or paper uh, that's not easily, doesn't easily get damaged. Whereas speech generation devices, you can push the buttons and a voice will, um, will come out of that little box or more typically an iPad now. Next slide, please. There are lots of people who have complex communication needs just because, um, just because they might have these uh, different disabilities, it doesn't mean that they have complex communication needs, of course, but these are some of the examples that I thought of that you might be familiar with. The more I talk to people about this, um, it's really interesting because there's always somebody who goes, huh, you know, there was somebody in my life who, who um, uh, could maybe speak throughout their life, but then something happened to them along the way and they didn't have access to communication, we didn't know it existed. Uh, it's really, really common for that to happen. And to me, that's one of um, the really important um, aspects of the communication boards is that the more people see them, the more we know that they exist. So um, there are many reasons why a person may not be able to communicate using speech, developmental disability or acquired disorder. And like I said, you might be able to think of someone in your life who has experienced something similar. Next slide, please. Um, so just a, a reminder that there's high tech and light tech. Um, one is not better than the other in any way. Some people have both. Um, so for example, when our daughter started kindergarten, she had light tech um, because we uh, didn't want uh, kindergarten to happen to a high tech tool and, and have to replace it often. Um, and now she also uses high tech. Um, and a lot of people who use high tech also have a light tech version because batteries run out and tech happens, right? So uh, it's good to always have, it's it's essential to always have something available. Next slide, please. Um, you can see that people get pretty creative about how to make sure that they have AAC at all times in the water, 
um, on their person at all times. So the, the picture on the right shows a harness that is made for AAC users so that they can carry it with them while still having their hands free. Um, and then the other two examples are homemade. And next slide, please. Just a few more examples of that. So, um, you know, for a while there were people in Minden wearing AAC on their shirts as part of an event that was planned a few years ago. Um, and that little bracelet that that somebody has, uh, we've actually handed that out at our, our children's school as an awareness, um, a little awareness function. It's pretty fun for the kids to walk home and show their parents what they what they can on their arm. Next slide, please. Uh, AAC use is becoming more familiar to people. Uh, there have been a lot of um, really great shows or really great examples of people using AAC. Um, people who have uh, acquired a communication challenge have spoken out in their later years about what that looks like for them. Next slide, please. And of course, probably one of the most famous examples of an AAC user is Stephen Hawking. So um, we often refer to him as as you know, having so much to say, and without that device, he he would have really struggled to be able to say it. So it's really important that people who need access to this equipment or this technology have access to it. Next slide. That's not always the case, though. It seems really simple, like oh, if you know you need this equipment, you get this equipment. But it's it's really not that easy for a lot of people. It can be cost prohibitive. Um, sometimes you have to prove you can use it before you can get access to it. And, you know, for anybody who uses an iPhone, I think it would have been hard for you before you had used that iPhone to just take it and know exactly how to use it. So um, it's not about testing people on whether or not they can use it. It's really about presuming competence. And the next slide, please. So again, this initiative does provide access to language, but it's more about raising awareness and promoting inclusion throughout the community. The more people who see this, the more familiar it will be to them, the more they'll know that um, they could use it or someone in their family could use it, and they know hopefully what, what it is and, and how it can be used. So next slide and then next slide. Here's just some examples of communication boards. There really doesn't seem to be a standard yet. Um, it's a newer, a newer project, so they all sort of look a little bit different depending on the community they're in, probably depending on the cost, um, depending on the time people have put into, into the project. So these are some examples that I think kind of um, probably work a little bit more for other people. And I'm really basing this on some of the feedback I've, I've heard from the, the community. So um, this particular board is low to the ground and near equipment. And the next slide, this board is, I think, some sort of vinyl and attached to a fence, but as you can see, it's still low to the ground. Next slide, uh, this board is attached right to the equipment and there's additional information on it. So I can't see what that additional information is, but um, there are, I think, numbers and letters. It looks like there's some text underneath that might talk about what the board is for. And then the next example, which is uh, very similar to a model we'll, we'll sort of be looking at, um, this, this board is low to the ground and it has numbers and, and letters on one side, core words and fringe words in the center. And then I think on the side, that's a little comic to explain what the board is and how to use it. Um, but Anne, to your point, that's a great place where we could put um, the ASL alphabet. So next slide, please. And next slide. So communication board planning has looked like this. Um, in October 2019, the idea of communication boards were brought forward to the Joint Accessibility Committee. Uh, we also spoke to it um, in Dysart, I think, as part of the, the Master Park Planning Project. Um, but Andrea can maybe speak more to that. The project has been on hold due to pandemic precautions at the beginning of the pandemic when people we weren't really encouraging people to touch everything. Um, and Dysart does have a grant opportunity deadline approaching. I don't know if you want to speak to that at this point, Andrea. Sure. I just, um, we are trying to get this done in 2023. Our treasurer would really like it, even though the grant, the time to spend, spend the funds for this particular grant is 2024. They want to have everything wrapped up in 2020 three, just because it's already been on the go for two years and some of the things were put on hold during COVID. So uh, it's just, there's a lot of reporting and work to be done with it. So one of the 
pieces as a communication board for the Rotary Beach side of Head Lake Park. Perfect, thank you. Um, and then when we were looking at the um, county communication boards, we were thinking about them as being in parks and playgrounds. Um, oh, sorry, Mark, can you go to the next slide? Um, parks and playgrounds, um, libraries, ideally. And then the next slide shows long-term care facilities or hospitals, um, places where people might be able to access them. And again, it does not replace an individual AAC device for, for people who need that, but um, it's a start. Hi, Anne here. Sorry, oh, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, go ahead, Anne. Thanks, Anne. Okay, um, so English is a second language too. It's more an inclusion rather than accessibility um, sort of an issue. But um, when you get uh, new Canadians and, and English is not their first language, a board like this uh, would be marvelous as well. It's just, um, just an additional thing that we can you, you can maybe add to it absolutely even early literacy um different ways of communicating with people you know if you include the the language for tag on the board it's it becomes um pretty fun to be able to run to the board and then run around and and uh and run back to it so um and it's really great too for you know toddlers who uh, have the language in their head but aren't yet able to express it um and also for uh, just a way for people to connect at the at the park and playground. Uh, the next slide, please. So additionally, we can start to look at how to bring the communication boards into emergency services. So, you know, um, I think you can see how it might be helpful to have something in the back of an ambulance or uh, something in an emergency department um, to help people who are maybe um, not able to speak due to due to trauma or, or something that they've experienced. And the next slide, and Andrea, if you can speak to these next two slides, they're just showing some of the work of MacArt Studios. So we've been in discussion with MacArt Studios. They have provided the games that you see in these, this slide and the next slide are games that they create and make. They're a company in Eagle Lake. Um, a lot of the work they do goes international or to the US or across Canada, um, but they have made these games and put them in the park for us. They're real, really well received by the members of the community. Um, so we, we had asked them if they would be able to create a communication board for us, knowing that they have the different forms of technology and um, the, the different materials that withstand being outside <laughs> year round. Um, and so Joe from McCart Studios is, is more than willing to do the, the board for us. And so for definitely the Rotary Beach side, we'll be using them. We're hoping to use them as well uh, if the county funding is approved to put one on the Head Lake Park side of the park as well. Um, and so there's different types of panels that they use. The, the ones that you see with like, who's your critter, the little squirrels there. Um, it's a type of, it's called DuraBoard. It's a very specialized material that they have, uh, that they have. but we were also looking at aluminum composite or um, something along those lines. So Joe has provided us with some samples because a question that came up during one of our meetings with uh, was, how hot do they get? Like if somebody's in the, you know, we just had some really hot weather two weeks ago and it's like, will somebody burn their hands touching it or or what will happen? So I am, um, she dropped off the samples this on Friday. However, we haven't had super hot weather, so they're still sitting wrapped up. Um, but I promised that when we had a hot day, I would lay them out and we would, and most communication boards are vertical, but we'll lay them flat and have the different materials, the three different types of material. So different people can touch them and see you know, can you hold your hands on it without burning yourself or or how hot, like, because the, the thought is too that somebody might have um, higher sensitivity to heat. So that's something that we're taking into consideration as well. So um, yeah, so that's where we're, we're heading and uh, quite excited about this project. Anything else there, Sue, that you want me to say? No, that's great, I think. Uh, Mark, next slide. Um, and yeah, Joe is also really excited about it, which is really um, making us even more excited about it. She's so enthusiastic to to get started and and to take a look at at what that looks like. Um, so definitely go play those play those games in that park if you haven't yet. They're fun, competitive though. Uh, <laughs> so the next slide, please. Um, just some examples. Like I said, there are so many uh, that I've seen. It, there doesn't seem to be a, necessarily a standard. You know, this is the board. This is the size. Anything like that. There is some sharing that people are doing in terms of sharing um, what they could look like, but um, this one we liked because it can be low to the ground and it has uh, room for, for lots of information. So 
um, the next slide, please. It's just showing you that there are um, some examples of language. So on this board, there's room for core language and fringe language. Core vocabulary is more generic and can be used across a wide variety of uh, a wide range of environments and a variety of communication partners. Um, approximately 80% of the words that we use each day are core words. So they're words used with frequency and across multiple contexts. Uh, for example, go, you, can, know. And then the next slide. This is an example of fringe words. Um, so fringe words, fringe vocabulary refers to vocabulary that is more specific to a topic, environment, or individual. So probably in most of our parks, the core and fringe words could be the same. If we put a, a board in the library, for example, we would likely want to change the fringe words. Although, you know, I can see dirt being on both boards because sometimes those librarians get into some interesting predicaments with experiments and projects and things like that. But um, but otherwise, the, the fringe words would be more, uh, you know, specific to that environment. Approximately 20% of the words we use each day are fringe vocabulary. Uh, and it's words used with decreased frequency that are usually context specific. So painting, robot, popcorn, boat. Um, and then the next slide, we've been in discussions with Toby Dynavox, who uh, creates PCS symbols, picture communication symbols. Uh, this is the PCS, the PCS classic symbol set here. It's a part of the Boardmaker software family. Um, it's often used with children, young students, and adults who are comfortable with its familiar style. As you can see, it's clear, simple, and uncluttered. So um, you, you very quickly can, can draw meaning from it. Uh, we have talked to them about what that would look like in terms of how do we how do we access this and 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 license it and what does that look like? It's actually a really easy process. We we create an account um, that our designer can use so that they can access the high quality images so that they're not blurry when when they're actually on a larger board. Um, and Toby Dynavox is super excited about this project too because um, it's exciting to see these communication boards go up and and to help raise awareness. And then the next slide, um, we have reached out to um, different people through the community, um, uh, several AAC users in Halliburton County. I've con uh, contacted five counties, so their speech language um, therapists and, and also their occupational therapists to, to talk about what the board would look like and, and how people can access it, um, as well as speech therapists and educators outside of the county the general community of AAC users and educators. So some of those people who went first in Australia are, are giving me their feedback on what worked and didn't work for them. And I've also mentioned it to the Halliburton County Service Providers Network so that they can ask service providers as well as clients and, and people in the community who might use it, what that could look like. And next slide. Andrea, is there anything else that you wanted to add? I think that um, one thing that was going to happen is Joe is going to, once she gets access to the high resolution images, she's going to put together a few different drafts of sample boards and then share them with us that can be shared to see which board makes the most sense or if what changes need to be made. Um, we are looking at a two-sided board and we had talked about having, in the end, I think we decided to have the same information on both sides or have most of the same information on both sides, but then have a little bit about the project on the back side. And as Sue said, where there's some extra space, the um, the sign language forms could pop, be put in there. So we're open to feedback. We uh, looked at boards that could raise or lower, but moving parts and mechanisms, but all of us agreed that that would be not a great idea. So we're looking at putting it low to the ground and having it higher and a four foot by eight foot panel. So quite large. Um, it's either that or going two feet by four feet or, or cutting the board in half, two feet by eight feet. Uh, but it made sense in our minds to look at four feet by eight feet. And some of those boards are pretty large that we saw pictures of for images of. Absolutely. A lot of the feedback that we've received so far has been about actual use of the board. So making sure that um, people can take it with them. If there's a board that's, you know, at the edge of the playground, it won't necessarily get much use as opposed to if it's closer to the equipment. Um, and some people have recommended having individual boards attached to that board. That can be tricky just because of vandalism, of, of course. But um, there's also a newer option that's coming out and has come out more recently, um, which, I mean, first of all, you can take a picture of, of the board on your phone and walk around the playground with that if you'd like. 
but uh, one, one group has actually created a QR code on the communication board so that um, if you do whatever you have to do with a QR code, you can access more information about the communication boards. And also it can take you to a screen with the communication board that has voice output. So you can now walk around the playground with it, press the buttons, and it's actually um, digitally sharing that voice with you as well. So uh, that's a, a really great option just to make it more of a functioning, a functioning project. Is that it? Did we get everything? Oh, Andrea? So the, the, we, we were trying to figure out if we could get to that point of having the electronic component right away. It's not quite there yet, like in terms of our project, but um, something that with the nice thing about working with somebody like Joe from McCart Studios is down the road when that becomes more accessible and we can actually get it, she can create the QR code and laminate it onto the board so it stays and it's permanent and then people have access to that sort of thing. If we, or if there's a slight change that needs to be made, it's easy enough with with their uh, boards to put in a little overlay and change something. Absolutely. Thank you so much. So that is our presentation. We just wanted to share with you what we've been working on so far and make sure we're we're getting all the feedback we need to to uh, to make it really successful and make it sort of a gem in the county. Thanks very, very much. And I think there are some questions. And Mike, I think you you've got a question or a statement. Well, I guess my my question is, um, there's a bit of information first. So uh, we've been setting aside $10,000 a year for this project. Um, the, the, I guess the good thing about the pandemic was that we were able to build up a fair amount of money in a reserve because we kept putting it in, but we weren't really doing the project. Um, I guess my question is, are you looking for a recommendation to fund a portion of that um, or take it? A portion of that allocation and fund the DISART board and in and which one and how much. Andrea, do you want to speak to that? Sure. Or, or if we, we would um if if we were looking, we would love it if there could be some funding towards the Head Lake Park side, the Rotary Beach we're doing through the grant, and um that's already taken care of. The Head Lake Park side, it would be fantastic. Um, something we have discovered over time is that we talk, We also talked about different mounting, um, different ways to mount it, and it, it sounds like a six by six treated post is the best way to go for being able to secure it in the ground and it doesn't move around um, versus being like on a fence post or something like that. Uh, the cost for, uh, so the, Joe did provide some pricing for us. Um, once we have designs in place, like so the initial design and everything is they figure about four hours and that's at $99 an hour. Um, and then when it say, for instance, it's moving to a different location or, or these boards are adopted elsewhere, a library or something, it might take maybe two hours or so of their time to change out the, the uh, information. And then it comes down to which type of material we're using. So the, the most affordable is aluminum composite at $849 for a four by eight, a four foot by eight foot sheet. And it's one eighth of an inch thick. Uh, then there's aluminum composite that's a quarter inch thick at $949 a sheet. And then um, a half inch DuraBoard, which is that one that you saw with who's the squirrels on it for $1,289 a sheet. So the price of the board I guess it just depends on how much labor is involved in creating the symbols or, or sorry, um, placing the symbols on the board and, and the information and then the cost of the board itself. So that's why we're trying to heat test so we know which one makes the most sense because I think they all will get hot, but which one will be tolerable on a really hot day in the middle of summer is what we're trying to figure out. So I don't, I didn't quite give you exact numbers, Mike, I'm sorry, <laughs> but. Well, I think we can work with that. If, okay. so would, would the committee be okay if we um, set aside up to $2,500 to be allocated uh, to DISART at all to assist in funding the AAC board at Head Lake Park? And then if the number, is, is that an acceptable number, Andrea? Like, I, I think so. That's what we have set aside for the Rotary Beach side of the park. So hopefully that's, okay. yeah, I think that is, yeah. Can, can we defer comment on that and ask some more questions first, for just sure. in case there's uh, overlap there? Yeah, Kathy. 
Um, I like the idea of putting sign language onto it, but there's no mention of Braille for blind people. And that's a critical thing too, that's communication. Has there been consideration of putting Braille signage up as well? So I think we have discussed that as well, and we have brought it forth to the designer. I'm not sure what that could look like from the designers. Um, it's To me, it seems like she can do anything. So <laughs> I'm hoping that she has um, the, the access and ability to do that as well. But it is something that we've considered as well. Please. Okay. Has there been consideration oh. of her? You got it. Has there been consideration of partnership with the school boards? Because what you're describing here is what the speech and language and communi augmentative communication staff do in school boards. And complementary signage could go up at the different schools in the area. Has that been shared? Um, not yet. We haven't been in discussions with anybody at the school board. I don't think it was a few years ago that we started these conversations, um, but it has come up that, you know, it would be great absolutely to see it everywhere, everywhere. And, and you know, once you have that little spark of an idea, it builds and builds and builds. So the, the more places, the better. Um, I think why we're, we brought it today to the table is just because, um, because Dysart needs to use that funding. Uh, if they're going first, we want to make sure that we have some consistency in the boards. So um, whatever that Rotary Beach board looks like, hopefully all the other boards could follow suit. Um, so we didn't want to, to make something separate and then make something separate again. Um, but in the future, hopefully we land on something that works really well in the community and then it, we can share it as, as much as need be. Thanks for that. Um, I, I think I'm gonna show my ignorance here because that's what I'm really good at. Um, I understand Braille is standardized, so I can I can relate to that. And, and depending on what kind of sign language you use, there's also various schools and disciplines for that. Um, when when you're talking about the pictorial type transfer, which is absolutely foreign to me, and that's where I'm showing my ignorance. Is there a standard universal set of symbols, or is it a set of symbols that would be developed for a specific area? Or is it something, for instance, like Halliburton County would say within Halliburton County, these are the symbols. Now the media and delivery platforms would be different, but a symbol that represents uh, I'm not feeling well would be the same on all of our boards, as opposed to something slightly different in one or the other. And you'd have to get educated in how it translates in that particular area. Do I explain myself? Yeah, absolutely. So that was a concern of mine too. There are numerous symbol sets that that are being used by people. There's um, numerous types of devices, numerous companies that, that work with, you know, there's all kinds of different options. Um, the reason why we are opting for picture communication symbols or PCS classic um, has just been because when I have reached out to educators, they say that it's the most common and the easiest to have access to. Um, but if there was another idea, Sure, go ahead. That, that really wasn't my question. Oh, okay. My question was, if we went with pictures, which I don't have a problem with, yeah. is there a set of universal pictures that would be, I mean, obviously they're going to be characterized slightly differently depending on who the artist is, but but someone with tears in their eyes, is that representative across everything uh, for a specific situation? Or, or is there different interpretations of, I, I don't feel well, depending on what school you're in? Now I'm making sense. Okay, wait, let me let me see if I can work through this. So for example, um, the symbol for sad. So the symbol for sad looks one way with this set of symbols, or there you could choose other options within that same symbol set. There are other symbol sets and the picture for sad would look different. If that makes sense. So it yeah, it's very much a language. So there are different symbols. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, you know, the, the symbols on one person's device might not match our board. Um, the symbols on another person's device might match the board. But the reason why we were looking at this symbol set was just because it is typically the most common and the easiest to access. So if we were to adapt that one, which, which I don't have a problem with, that would be the one that would use more or less across Halliburton County for all of our boards. I think that's what we were thinking just for the design wise. Otherwise we would have to purchase other licenses yep. for those other symbols and, and redesign. Um, but it doesn't mean that the symbols um, would necessarily be the same on every board. 
if, if that makes sense. I think our symbol for sad will be my face if you're a county council meeting. But <laughs> that will be our or, or our face when you leave. <laughs> <laughs> Um, ben, did you have your hand up as well? Did you? No. No. Um, so I've got a question. Mm -hmm. If I put myself into the position of someone who might depend on on this board or find it really useful because they're outside of their home and they they want to genuinely communicate, the piece that I'm feeling is missing are some of the empowerment words like like where are we going to go next are mm -hmm. we going to go to the beach are we going to go to the cottage are we going to go for you know on the lake for a boat ride for a ski it, a lot of these words i'm looking at the word list that, mm -hmm. that you've attached a lot of them are about here now what i'm doing but in in able to express an opinion about where to go next what to do next that it feels like someone who is using this board might be sort of excluded from that conversation if all they had was the board, which is going to be rare because most people will, I'm sure, have their own methods with them. But but it's the one piece that I felt was sort of absent. I wonder if you had thoughts on that. Sure, that's a great question. So it's not robust language, like it's not a robust vocabulary. Um, and it's really important that you said that because a lot of times when people think about AAC, they think about you know, what do you want? Do you want this one or, or this one? Well, what if you want this one over here, but it hasn't been an option? Or what if it's not that you want something, you just want to express how you feel or what you're thinking about a TV show you're watching? Um, so in that sense, it's not a robust communication device. Uh, ideally, though, there could be a symbol to say it's not here, it, it's in my talker right. or it's in my device. Um, that's what our daughter's AC book says. It's, it's not here. Like, I, I can't find what I'm trying to say. Um, and so I think that's a, a really important piece. The other thing is we did, I don't think we spoke to this, but uh, as well with a QR code, we wanted to make sure that potentially people could um, be led back to the accessibility committee page where they could learn more about what this is and how they can access it themselves if they need to, because like I said, there are a lot of people who don't have it, who, who could, um, and also a lot of people who might, um, be more interested or or think, huh, I think I know somebody who could. So we want to make sure that there's more information about how to access more language so that if you are at the board and you don't have something, um, you can find out how, how to get more for sure. Any other thoughts? Should we circle back to Mike's question then about an upset limit for, for support to the project? Anyone, any dissenters? Looks pretty good. Can we get a motion? Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, anyone would like to move on that? Lisa, Councillor Shell, um, Ben. Moved by Councillor Shell, seconded by Member Dykstra. Be it resolved that the Joint Accessibility Committee receives for information the June 14th, 2023 presentation on the Communication Board's initiative, and that it be recommended to Halliburton County Council that up to $2,500 be allocated to Dysart et al. to assist in funding the AAC at Head Lake Park. All in favor. Great. Could I just comment if before Andrea leaves that I think we owe a great debt to Andrea for being persistent with this. And even through the pandemic, she didn't let it drop. She kept moving forward on it. And Sue has been there to support her. So thanks so much, Andrea. We really do appreciate it. Thank you, Mike. All right, um, on to um, the front entrance steps ramp and railings report. Come on up. Good Go afternoon. Uh, I'm Robert Sutton, Director of Public Works for the County. And I guess, to, you know, in light of what Mike was saying about the goal of trying to get here, uh, before we go too far. This is a very preliminary report that we just wanted to bring. We don't have a lot of measurements. It's more of a philosophy of what we're thinking of doing to make sure that uh, we try to hit those minimum standards, but also try to hit um, the recommended standards. There's the uh, different guidelines that are out there. And I'm like Sue, not a specialist in this area. So we're uh, bringing this information to you now and uh, open for some advice. I'd like to also uh, thank Sue. She was very helpful in the uh, writing of the grant. So again, this report is about a grant that the city, sorry, the county got. 
to do some accessibility improvements to this building. And we're starting with the outside ramp and stairs, um, to trying to get that done before Mike retires is, uh, is our goal. This, uh, the grant has a deadline to be done in about two years. And uh, so we're trying to focus on that outside in um, to allow people to get in and get service. Uh, and then there's some other items that are noted in the report to deal with uh, some doors and uh, some, some washrooms. So I'm not sure how, like, like you said, you want to be informal. Uh, I'm not sure if Mark can bring up the pictures at the end of the report and just we're open for discussion. The, uh, the idea being is that we're planning to meet all the standards, you know, get new rails and uh, cover the ramp with a rubberized material, which I brought it. some samples. It's a uh, recycled material that gets troweled on and uh, it's good for slip resistance as well as it should allow us not to have to rebuild uh, the entire stairs and the ramp. So it's also a cost saving type measure. So as mentioned, we've got um, We've got the regulation where it'll say minimum width of 900 millimeters, but there's also the uh, the Global Alliance Accessibility Tech uh, Technologies and Environment uh, Illustrated Guide, which gets into recommending recommending different things that could be more usable. So instead of 900, it would say a recommended width would be 1,100 millimeters uh, for a width if you could make it. The landings, which the regulation will say 1,670 millimeters or 1.67 meters um, square landing, it recommends, say, if you can get to 2.4, which might be make it easier for certain people and different uh, mobility um, devices to, to get up that ramp. And we will try and get as much as we can towards the higher end of those numbers. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Uh, we've met with certain contractors. We, because of the cost, the railings are rather expensive. Uh, we'll have to tender this and get a bit of a design there because we wanna make sure that we uh, do meet all standards because there's also building code standards and, and liability. So we wanna make sure before we go to tender that we've heard, um, heard from this committee, see if there's any recommendations, any other uh, guidelines or, or people we could or should discuss um, our plans before we go out there and, and spend a lot of money and find out that maybe we missed something big. Yes, do you have a question? Uh, yeah, Robert, just to, looking at this, and it looks, looks great. I'm assuming it comes as a coating, which means you can apply it with some kind of a roller or similar system. And it looks like it comes in more than one color. You're correct. It's a recycled material. It comes in literally an infinite amount because they just, they mix it like pancake mix. Um, and so it's, you know, so many cups of this color, so many cups of that. Uh, and they, it's actually troweled on. Uh, so it's like a liquid material. They trowel it on uh, kind of like concrete. And it's very easy to repair in the future because of the mixture that if something has to be cut, they can come in, cut it and, and repair it. Um, there is, uh, let's see, the picture that's up there now on the bottom picture, that's actually a business in Kinmount, if uh, if anybody wanted to go visit. Um, our stairs would have, of course, the uh, uh, the bull nose highlighting and, and as per the standards, but this is just showing an example of the top picture is what the stairs look like before, and the bottom picture is what it looks like after. So really what we're proposing to do to the outside ramp, uh, if you go maybe back to the first page of pictures, um, Mark, thank you. So on the bottom is a picture of the ramp, kind of the first ramp closest to the road, and then the second ramp uh, coming up to the landing into the front doors. Uh, we believe right now we're about 900 mils width wise. We believe we can cut back the concrete. Uh, to gain some more room to make that wider to try to get it over a meter uh, width on both ramps going up. The handrails would all be removed if it's going up the, up the ramp. Now the handrails come vertical and then they go in and they swing into the ramp area. So um, the middle ramp would 
require a guard. So that's like almost like a fence. And then would have handrails on both sides of that middle, middle area, um, the front and the wall side would just have a handrail um, that would meet code at the proper height and uh, give as much space as possible uh, clearance up and down the ramp. Uh, the biggest challenge we probably have is making the landing by the tree, so the middle landing, um, making that as big as possible. That's where we're kind of short on distance between, say, the tree area and the turnaround area. Uh, that's that's our most challenging part that we think of right now that we'll be looking at improving that as best as possible. Sounds um, sounds superb. Are there questions or comments from those more knowledgeable amongst us? Yes, I found just getting into the building that getting on the ramp has been very tight for someone just with the specific size chair. I don't understand how adding on the new material that you've shown us can make it easier for us to get up that ramp. Or has it just been for the steps? No, uh, excellent question. So the material is planned for the steps as, as well as the ramp. Um, that way we, if going up it today, you probably noticed that uh, the, um, some of the paving stones, they break there. They're not, uh, they're not hardy. They don't last. So we'll be able to have this material on the surface, but the improvement to the ramp for, for yourself and others would be widening out the entrance, widening out the landing in the middle and widening out the ramp itself so that it's just bigger and wider and, and meets and or exceeds the standards that are recommended by the various agencies. So um, the material should help some people go up. It's, it is better for slip resistance and, and whatnot, but uh, it's more of those improvements on the width and the length uh, that would probably help yourself and others. Right. Um, also, I think that there could be something done to, like when you get out and you're trying to get onto the sidewalk from the road, the curb to the sidewalk is a bit high. So if there's a way that you can get from the road to the sidewalk, something we could do to make it easier for wheelchairs to go upwards and onto the sidewalk, because some spots are easier than others. Some are a little lower, some are a bit too high. If there's something we can do about that. Yes, Kathy. There actually is no um, designated parking out front. There is a sign across the street on the building over there, which hopefully is going to be changed because it's not current, but there would need to be designated parking and the curbs looked at. Uh, yes, part of the funding is to create a uh, designated spot. We're looking at options. It, uh, I think everyone knows it's a challenging area. Uh, and we do have some space across the road that we were looking at um, as one alternative, but we're also trying to investigate another location. Uh, the, as Ben mentioned out front, the sidewalk is very close to the road and it's very close. So it's very challenging to get a parking spot out front, particularly with the uh, large hydro pole that's there. So um, there's just not enough width for a proper um, fully accessible spot there. So staff, we are we are looking at that. The part of the funding is for this, and we are hoping um, to get more than one spot, maybe one out back, one out front, something like that. But uh, we just haven't got there yet. Uh, one more question. Also, like I know we'll move on to inside the building because you wanted to discuss washrooms, but I'd also like to possibly discuss the elevator. I find that the elevator works. I just find that, like, let's say multiple people with disabilities wanted to use it, it would be too small. Yes, uh, the elevator is, is a huge challenge for the cost and, and the use. Um, we are going to be looking at inside the building. At this time, we don't have any funding for um, improving the elevator. But uh, it's certainly something that we can keep our eyes out for uh, other accessibility grants that look at more of a major renovation. Um, the elevator itself, I, I understand what you're saying, it's rather small and uh, it's a little on the rickety side. So um, we, we would look to improve that if possible. All right. Yeah, and we did have a nice conversation this morning at, at County Council, uh, uh, Committee of the Whole, I should say, about 
um, once the entrance is complete, what about the, the inside and, and how do the, the exterior plans dovetail with possible renovations to the inside? So I think there's, um, there's definitely an eye on the prize. Uh, and, and a lot of it is, is going to be about where the funds come from and in, in what phases, but we're a little bit limited with the funds that we have now, if I'm not speaking at a turn, um, uh, on what we can, what we can um, put them towards, but future phases will, will bring future rewards, that's for sure. Cease. Yeah, one of the things, and, and again, this, this is not my territory either, but it's a challenge that I see all the time with people who, who, um, they can't use a walker, they have to use a wheelchair. And oftentimes they come in a vehicle that's been designed for them to be able to do that. The parking that's required for those vehicles is quite a bit different than the parking that you would normally have just for what you would call handicap parking. Uh, are we looking at possibly putting a parking spot somewhere else? And I realize we can't put it up front or if we can, that would be awesome. But if we can't, are we looking at part of the parking lot at the bottom? to accommodate that, that type of vehicle. Now I realize there may not be a lot of them, but I think we should have at least one or maybe two that would be designated for that. It's just my opinion. You, you're, talking uh, about the, you're talking about the double space, right? So that when somebody has a wheelchair and they have to open for their ramp to come out? Correct. Absolutely, because so many people don't understand that you need a double parking spot for that, really. It's, it's, a, it's a two car width, isn't it? And I, I see so many people parking over that. Um, but they don't realize that people designed like that need need the full, the, like a double parking spot. Uh, good, nice, thank you. That's a good call. Yes, excellent question. We are looking at that. This, the um, Again, not an expert on the standards, but typically the standards will suggest if you have um, one spot, it would be like this. If you have two spots, you would try to do this uh, and so on. So we are looking to incorporate a spot like that that would be the larger size. Because I know that when you go to a shopping center where that uh, type of, of parking is there, it clearly identifies that it's not for handicap parking. It is for vans. And if you park in there and you're not a van, you're going to get fined. So it, it's, it's a way of just not just reserving it for those people who, who have the challenge and require that space. I, I can maybe add a little to that. It's... We do actually have it painted at the appropriate width across the, the road at the other building, which will service this building as well. Okay. We haven't signed it and formalized it yet, but we it is painted to the appropriate width. Uh, we had that done last fall. We just have to do the other work to support that. One of the challenges we need to work with the township though is to cross, uh, to, um, to, to uh, paint an appropriate crosswalk so that they can get to this building safely, but yes. And, and with that, the appropriate curb cut uh, with the tactile warning devices. So uh, what I was mentioning, where we're trying to get into the additional spot is that plus something. So we're, we're trying to go somewhat above and beyond, but again, knowing that that spot is across the street and, and not in front of this building. So we're, we are um, exploring opportunities. To, to see what we can do for additional spots. Great. Any other feedback? Yes, Kathy. Just an observation. The um, It's great to hear that something is already set aside across for an accessible parking spot, uh, but snow removal becomes one of the partners that needs to come into play because I know the one behind the building was covered in snow. Like it's, I guess, does it, who looks after the snow removal to make sure people can come in the winter? Uh, we did have a uh, landscaper that was snow removal contract. However, uh, plans are in place for the county to take over some of this this year. That would be on the private property side. And uh, the township is responsible more for the road itself. So it's a combination. We do um, staff here. Uh, we pick up a shovel sometimes if it's snowing in the middle of the day uh, to uh, put down some salt or sand as well as uh, clear walkways in the ramp. Now, forgive me if I'm speaking at a turn, but this is not related to the ramp, but this is accessibility related. Uh, down by the apartment complex in Minden, is there a way we could possibly consider a sidewalk so that when you leave the apartment complex, if you wanted to access the fitness center, you wouldn't have to move your wheelchair through the parking lot? 
if we could I bring could, that through to Minden itself or yeah if I could um we'll make a note of that and we'll we'll do a um actually if if the committee would would pass a resolution to that effect um and I'll craft something while we move on to the next item and then um we can pass that request on to the local municipality no problem all right so we need a resolution to make that a, a formal yes form. okay that sounds good so we can we can definitely do that I'm I'm conscious of the time um are there any immediate other immediate points of feedback on this report before we okay Thanks very much for that. That's um, exciting news, very exciting news. Thank you for the input and support. So Mike, do you wanna do both resolutions now? Um, I have the one ready and then I'll work at the you other one. Very nice. um, so if we had a mover and a seconder, well, well I read it first. Yes. Um, be it resolved that Halliburton County Joint Accessibility Committee with uh, receive for review and comment the June 14th, 2023 staff report, administration building front entrance steps, ramp and railings report, and further that the committee offered the following comments, that the county widened the ramp and landings as much as possible, that consideration be given to formalizing an accessible parking space with appropriate grades to sidewalk, and that consideration to be given to upgrading the elevator in future renovations. All in favor? Or is that a comment or an all in favor? All in favor. All, in favor. all right. All. I, I need a mover oh, and a second. Right, okay, Ben, you move. Any seconders, Kathy? Thank you. And all in favor? Wonderful. Great. Um, so I believe we've got two more quick points to cover, and then um, I think Andrea would like to come back for a, for a bit. Okay. Um, the accessibility updates to the county website and meeting software. Michelle, is that your wheelhouse? Yes, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, committee. Uh, my name is Michelle Moore. I'm the deputy clerk here at the county. I'm pleased to share with you today the various accessibility updates to both the county website and our iCompass meeting software. Regarding the county's website, the IT director has shared the following information with me to on pass to committee today. So since 2019, uh, the county has uh, created a new website that was built to be WCAG 2.0 AA compliant. We've acquired a software platform that scans all of our municipal websites for accessibility issues. The IT, the IT director has advised that this software is underutilized at the moment, but he hopes to start making better use of it as we go forward. We've also acquired the Adobe Acrobat Pro which is uh, the software has some accessibility tools incorporated within and it's been rolled out to municipal staff. We have also acquired an online PDF remediation tool. It's called Equidox, which has been purchased to allow us to remediate existing PDF documents. Uh, further, we have held group training exercises for staff on creating accessible documents in both Word and Adobe. This training has been recorded, which has been a great resource for staff to go back to and review as required. Many of our existing website PDFs have been converted to online forms. As well, uh, the PDFs that were formerly on the county's website have all been audited and have either been removed if they weren't accessible and no longer needed, or they've been remediated and reposted. However, that being said, due to the volume of of PDF documents that were on the site, staff are still working on remediating some of that content. So this project is still underway. And um, in connection with uh, our department head team and the CAO, we have now put a policy in place where all the documents that are going up on our site must be accessible as of May 1st. Regarding the county's meeting software, um, we've had an update to our site over the last two years. So we've reconfigured our staff reports and they're now published in HTML format so that they're more accessible. Any PDF documents that staff attach to their reports have also been remediated through both Equidocs and our PDF accessibility checker. So that software, um, sorry, the PDFs are run through both software and they're added to staff reports and they're published on the agendas. And we no longer allow, which uh, members of county council can appreciate today, 
we no longer allow presentations or background materials for, <clears throat> excuse me, from our delegates to be included on published agendas unless they are in accessible format at the time of submission to the clerk's department. So I'm happy to take any questions. When it comes to some of the website, although in the absence of our IT director, I don't know if I can mm -hmm. share quite as much of the technical detail as he could if he was present here today, but uh, happy to take any questions. And I, I know there's one thing that, that we always used to do when we were doing uh, accessible websites. I actually teach uh, website accessibility at Seneca as well. But um, we have um, uh, honesty statements are always a, a good thing. So if you say if, if you find a document uh, because of the large volume of the documents, some of them are not able to be remediated. If there is a document you you would like, uh, please let us know and we'll do our best to get it in an accessible format for you. Uh, and, and so it's more of an honesty statement that we know not all of our documents are accessible. And I, I think that that um, allows people to know that you're really um, a, trying to make everything um, good, but it's not just not always possible. Um, and, and, and sometimes some people, only one person would want a, a really old document. So it's not practical to have all documents uh, uh, created uh, being fully accessible. So a little honesty statement seems to go a long way. Um, a, a lot of websites put that on now. I don't know if that's something you have on there. No, thank you for the suggestion, and I'll be sure to on pass that to our IT director. Thank you, Anne. That's a great idea. Any other feedback or thoughts? It's a lot of work. It's a lot of good stuff. Yeah, yeah. it's been a team effort here for sure. Thank you. Yeah. How often is this website updated? Apologies, Mike, are you able to um, the, provide so some? So the, in terms of, updates to the website it's done regularly so they are you know it could be you know daily weekly in terms of a fulsome review of the website and a fulsome um redo or update i would say that was two years ago three years ago okay i was talking more in terms of like say if one of our meetings were to be uh taken aback and moved to another month um just because it felt like it took a while to kind of get that We'll take that into consideration for sure. Yeah. Uh, we'll, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll work to do that. Thank you. Um, and then finally, we've got a, dis and almost finally, we've got a discussion regarding the multi-year accessibility plan and next steps. Um, so yeah, so we have Andrea back um, talking about a playground uh, project that she's doing, if we can remember that. Yep. Um, the uh, the multi-year accessibility plan, um, as I mentioned earlier, we've reached out to the local municipalities to ask them for a list of their projects. You'll be able to review that and and hopefully through the lens of, um, you know, looking at your experience in the community and, and making suggestions on how it could be improved um, or, or projects that have been missed or aren't on the plan, aren't early enough in the plan. Um, those kinds of things. So you'll be you'll be reviewing that document or those those uh, projects in the very near future. Um, and uh, as I say, we've we've reached out to the local municipalities, asked for that information before your next meeting, and uh, and so hopefully that is an, an agenda item for the next okay, the next. But I would you know one of my goals is to make sure that that is done sort of by the fall so that we can. Uh, can make sure that we have that to put with our next year's accessibility, uh, uh, our compliance at the end of the year. Okay, thank you. Uh, and Andrea is back with us for an update. Yeah. Do you want to take it away, Andrea? Sure. So um, at our last council, or sorry, at our council, one of our council meetings, council approved that staff could go ahead and apply for a grant for the Harcourt Community Centre to put a playground outside there. Because at the moment, there's just some swings. It's really, it's it's lacking in terms of any kind of amenity. So uh, there was a Trillium grant application that was due, I believe it was yesterday or today, for uh, up to $150,000. So we've applied for the full amount. Um, that being said, if we are successful with the grant, which we won't know until probably late summer, or early fall, um, there's a short turnaround in terms of getting the work done and ordering, et cetera. So we're asking the Joint Accessibility Committee if there's any 
Um, and this is something you can think about. And then at your next meeting, let us know if you have any recommendations and some we have from the previous um, meeting, but just about uh, things that you'd like to see at the playground. Keep in mind, it's $150,000 total. Council won't be putting in any extra to the project if we're successful. Um, that would include installation, site preparation, uh, ground cover, equipment, all of that would fit into that price tag. Um, so, and we, this would something we would tender out we want, if, if we're successful with the grant, we'd say, these are the specs that we're hoping to achieve, send it out for tender and see what, what options are provided to us. So it's, it's, we're trying to just see what some suggestions might be like. I know there was the idea of like a trundle swing or having something together. There was a zip track versus a zip line. And that's something that we're thinking about for out there. It is a community that has obviously it's, it's smaller in size and the use might be a bit different than it is over in Head, Head Lake Park, but we're, we're asking for any suggestions or feedback ahead of time just on, or I guess not feedback, but suggestions on what might be appropriate equipment to put in there. Does that make sense? Um, it does. So you're looking for like an equipment suggestion list for, for right now from the group. Is that the, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. And then that way we, when, we, when, if we're successful, hopefully we are, then we can just say, to the companies that we're putting out to tender, here are the specs that we want to meet. What can you do for this price? And right. meet, what what of these can you meet? So um, like, you know, the suggestion came up of having a transfer station at the bottom of the slide or having, um, yeah. so so different things like that. Just if there's, if there's certain suggestions or things that the committee has or would like to see, then if you can provide those to us at the next meeting, like just make a list and then provide them to us, we'd appreciate it. Okay, that's great. It's uh, superb and good that we can think, ruminate and come back with a list. Um, and certainly at the last meeting, there were some really good uh, suggestions made too that would probably immediately get folded into, into this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a good homework for us. Yes. Could you make a list of the things that have already been brought forward so that we don't duplicate ourselves? Well, we I have mean, I remember list. talking about the treadle swing. Yeah, and there's a few other things too that were were, were mentioned and well deserved. So yeah. I was wondering so, if we could get a summary of what's already been suggested, so that we can not duplicate that. Michelle actually provided a summary after the last meeting, so I'm not sure if um, if Michelle, if you're able to circulate that, or if you want me to circulate that, or she's, to send something to Mike. She's nodding. Oh, sorry. nodding and smiling. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Right. Andrea, anything else that um, you'd like to mention for, for now? No, nope, no, nope. we're just, we're hopeful that we can make something work out in another part of the community. Yeah, let's, let's keep our fingers crossed for sure. Thank you. Um, all right, so we've got a, our next meeting date, September the 13th, um, at uh, the usual that time, I suppose. Um, I am going to be away, so perhaps if we could delegate a chair, a substitute chair for that day, or um, do you want to do that on the day? The committee could pick one that day, okay. yeah, if we need a meeting. Okay, great. Go ahead, and then you've got a resolution, don't you? Yeah, yeah. And, but I, I would just say that if in the meantime we are required to meet um, because somebody's doing a project and they need uh, us to do the review, we'll call that meeting um, and give as much notice as we possibly can, and, and uh, hopefully we can get as many involved as possible. Great. Okay. Um, so, do you have the address of your building? Um, uh, I, I've heard of it, but I know that it's next to the fitness center in Lincoln. Mm -hmm. So, it's a little away from there. So, I'm going to... I'm going to... The newest building or the building that's built first, then? Which, which building are you next to? The new... The, I'm not there yet, but it, it is the newest one. So, you're moving into one that's the three-story one? Yeah, I would be on the top floor. It's on Park Street. Now. That's yeah. It's fifty-seven B Parkside Street. Yeah, my son's in that building too, actually. Oh, yeah. I just uh, we just got news the uh, wheelchair accessible apartment on the, on the top floor, and I just think it. I bet yeah. you're across. I think you're going to probably be across the hall from my son then. That's why I was kind of suggesting an adjacent sidewalk because that way you don't have to go to the parking lot and you want to access the fitness center beside it. I would just rather avoid the odds of that. 
traffic accident. Yeah. Could we? I, I'd hate for that to get lost. Would you mind just clicking your microphone on and, and saying that last line again? You don't have to repeat where you live, but just tell us why you think that's important. So it's in the meeting. Well, I think it's important that we consider building an adjacent sidewalk on uh, Park Street next to the apartment complex, just so that if somebody with disabilities uh, wants to leave their apartment and go to the gym on the other side of the area, or if they'd like to, you know, walk around, go to somewhere like Molly's or whatever, that there's less likelihood of getting involved in a traffic issue, like if someone is backing out of the parking lot. Yeah, really fair. <laughs> All right, so you've got a so resolution. Tell me if I've captured this. Um, be it resolved that staff be directed to prepare a letter asking that the Township of Minden Hills install a sidewalk between the apartment buildings located at 57B Parkside Street in Minden and the SG Nesbitt Community Center so residents can safely travel between the two facilities. Is that fair? Yeah. Um, a mover and a seconder, please. Ben would like to move. Any seconders? Yes. Oh, yes. Um, cease. All in favor? Good. So I think that um, wraps us up. Do, could, do we have a, a motion to adjourn? Cease again. Thank you. And I don't think we need a second or for a journey, do you? You don't, but we typically do. All oh, right, can I just second it? And we'd like to also adjourn. Okay. Moved by Councillor Ryle, seconded by Member Dykstra, be it resolved that the June 14th, uh, 2023 meeting of the Halliburton County Joint Accessibility Committee now adjourn. All in favor. Thank you. And we'll see you next time. Excellent. Well done, Captain. <laughs>